Good evening. Uh, before I get started, I wanted to give uh, a little update, as I've given updates on children's ministry many times. Um, and uh, this one deals specifically with our Awana ministry, and it's been a big praise. Uh, we, <clears throat> after we got started a couple months in this past, well, they must have got different lights, because this is way brighter than I'm used to. <clears throat> and so, I mean, I give announcements, but when you're up here, oh, it's just different. Okay. Well, they reevaluated what staffing we needed because this is the first year we've had Awana in 10 years. Uh, so after we got started, we looked and said, okay, what do we really need? Uh, and Ron Lane was a big part of that. He's our Awana commander. And as they went through, they identified what needs do we have when it comes to staffing. And Ron let me know this past week, he said, it's a praise. We have a full team. Uh, and so that's a great thing. We, we've been adding one to two people every week almost since we've started uh, the year. And so it's, it's been exciting to see there's a lot of energy in the WANA program. Uh, what that means is that we have certain ratios and certain uh, um, ratios of students to, to leaders that we try to meet. And so cause we feel this would be ideal uh, to have at least these ratios so we can have an effective ministry to the kids. And so we've had a lot of people uh, joining, excited, um, and, and, and to help us with those ratios. What that does not mean is that there's no room for you to help in Awana. Um, because even though that we have what we consider a full team, uh, people always get sick. And so kids always get sick and have to miss for one reason or another. Uh, and you can always have more individuals loving on those kids. Um, and so it's a great praise to be able to have. Uh, we are looking forward to the day that we can also give this praise with our Sunday morning ministries as we're still looking for people, but God is providing. And it's neat to see every week. I mean, he just provides the next step. And so it's been a great praise for that. Um, a lot of times people, as, as I'm up here preaching, and, and Pastor Barnett's out there, and he's not this week as he's away, as you know, uh, they'll say, is it nerve-wracking to have your boss um, out there when you preach? And so because he'll a lot of times give us pointers, and it's like, do you feel like you're being graded, like you're at school? And you're like, no, it's not. It's not that kind of pressure. He's always been so encouraging. Uh, and tonight, there's a different pressure on me um, because my parents are here. And so I just got to see them as they walked in. And so I haven't seen them yet until I gave them a hug as they were sitting in the row and it's not a pressure because I'm nervous about what they're going to say, but it's a pressure uh, because I, I really want them to be pleased uh, with the way that I'm using my gifts for God's glory. Uh, because I know that's what my dad and my mom have both trained me to do since I was a little boy. And so I really, that's my goal. And I want and it's extra pressure when they're to see, there to see it in person. Um, and so that's the kind of pressure that I feel today, but it's a good pressure. We're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 19, um, and if I would have seen Justin's before tonight, I would have just put one or two verses myself, um, but it's two separate verses that we're keying in on in that chapter, but we're looking at the chapter as a whole. Um, so 1 Kings chapter 19, I'm going to start off by reading two verses from that chapter, uh, just to key it off, and then we're going to kind of come back and, and review a little bit as we look at... Why are those verses significant? And what is God's responses to those verses? So 1 Kings chapter 19, I want to read verses 4 and 14 with you right now. So 1 Kings 19 verse 4, and it says, But he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord's. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. Also verse 14, which says, He said, being the same person, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it. Now, these words, as you read them, they don't sound like the words that are coming from a spiritual champion. They sound more like words that come from someone that's worn down, that's beaten down. 
that's had many struggles and, and the person that's ready to give up. And these words actually are, in fact, the words of the prophet Elijah. He stood up to Ahab, the prophets of Baal, and Asherah, and he won. How did he get to this point in his life where he's ready to give up? He's so distraught, and he's saying, I, I've made it this far. I'm done. I'm, re I'm ready for you to take me, Lord, because I I'm not feeling like I can go on anymore. What I want us to be looking at is how, do we, how often do we get to that point? What situations come up to us where we feel like life is wearing us down to the point where we're like, I don't know if I can go on any longer? How many times do we reach opposition that comes against us and we think, why is this happening? I shouldn't have to go through this just like Elijah went, went through in his plea. Uh, before we take a look at God's response to Elijah, and that's what we're going to focus in on, how does God respond to these phrases that Elijah says? Before we can look at that, I want us to take a little review of the life of Elijah up to this point to see how did Elijah get to this point. Uh, when, when I think of Elijah, the first thing I think of is the fire coming from heaven. And when I think of that, and, and he's defeating all those prophets, I think, how can that man get here? How can he feel so low after having such a, a great miracle uh, in front of him? <clears throat> so today we're going to look at, kind of in whole, uh, the chapters of 17, 18, and 19 of 1 Kings, but our focus is going to be on chapter 19. Uh, and before we jump in, I'd love to pray with you tonight. Dear God, we love you very much. Uh, we pray that, that we would have open hearts to hear your words. Allow us to soften them. Allow the Holy Spirit to soften them. Allow us to be open to what you have to say. And as we think of this passage, Lord, and see times that we're frustrated, times that we're hurt, times that we feel alone, help us to be encouraged by your response to Elijah, Lord. We pray these things in your name. Amen. As I think about the life of Elijah and what we're going to be talking about tonight, it reminds me of a time that I went through in high school. Um, I feel like I tell more stories about myself up here than I do almost anywhere else, but it's probably because I'm a good example of many of not the best qualities. Um, so I can see why God's brought things in my life. But as I think about this, it goes back to a time in high school where I was on a teen leadership conference. And so we went away. It was a youth group event. I went with a bunch of friends, and we drove somewhere, and it was a conference. And it wasn't like your week of camp uh, where you have a lot of games and a lot of activities and a lot of fun time and a little bit of chapel. This was like almost all chapel, and then you're with your friends, and so they do have some activities, but it's meal times, but it's really focused on God's Word and challenging teens to be better leaders. And so at this time, I remember one night uh, with a bunch of the guys, we were staying up late, and, and I've learned in working in youth ministry, if you ever want to get a student to say something, or if you ever want to know what's really going on, you, you pack a week full of things, get them really tired, keep them up late, and then ask them deep questions. Uh, because there's, there's really no filter that happens at that point. And so they've lost that ability when it gets late. At least that's how I was. Um, and so we got to this late point, and, and we're talking, and we're actually, it's good stuff. We're encouraging each other, uh, and we're, but we get to the point where we start talking about struggles. And so what struggles are we going through? And I remember sharing, and so I it got, I mean, I was sharing along with the other guys, and I shared about what I felt were hardships of being uh, a pastor's kid. And I thought about this before I even knew my parents were going to be here, and so, it, so it has nothing to do with them. Uh, but the hardships of being a pastor's kid, and so I went and, and, and was sharing how I thought there were certain struggles that we went through, how people were, were watching us all the time and see, how do we act? And it almost felt like it was a judge of how mom and dad raised us based on how we act. And, and at times it became tough, especially when there's big arguments on the way to church, and then you're supposed to be really good and pretend nothing happened because people are watching. And so I share these things and, and, and share what was on my heart. And, and a lot of it I was like, man, I've never had the guts really to share this before, and then all of a sudden everyone's around, like, you know, that happens with my family too. 
And they're like, you know, we, we have frustrations, and mom and dad wants to be good and pretend like nothing ever happens. And so I found out I'm not alone. This isn't just unique to a pastor's family. Um, it's, it happens to all normal families because we struggle. We have hardships. We don't have perfect relationships. And so as I see Elijah, and as I see what we're going to be talking about, that's kind of the big picture that I see with him. Uh, so what we're going to do right now is do a quick run-through on uh, Elijah's life, and I believe that helps us understand the comments that he made, why he made them, and then the comments that God makes and how he responds to Elijah's words. So we're going to run through this a little bit quickly, uh, but it starts off in chapter 17. We see Elijah get on the scene, and there's no real long introduction. We see who he is, and then it jumps right into the heart of the conflict. As 17.1 says, Now Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these days except by my words. So we see initially that a Elijah tells Ahab there's going to be no rain. Um, and so we, you may wonder, why in the world is he saying there's going to be no rain? Well, if we read chapter 16, we get a very good clue as we see a, kind of an explanation of Ahab's kingship as he's ruling the nation of Israel. 16 verses 29 to 34 give that overview, but verse 33 kind of sums it up. So 1633 tells us a little bit about Ahab when it says, And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So we may think, why is this happening? Well, that, it's right there. Ahab was the most evil king that had ruled Israel up to this point. And so no one had come close to him. He's already surpassed everybody and how evil he is. And so we have Elijah going up against the most evil king in the world and saying, guess what, I have really bad news for you. There's going to be no rain until I tell you there is. So immediately there's this conflict. Uh, and just thinking, okay, that's what prophets do. They, they give words from the Lord, especially when kings are not living right. But that's how Elijah's mission starts. He's not called to live an easy life as a prophet. He's called to give... Uh, to give God's words, and that's right now bringing bad news. And so that's how it starts. Then we see chapter 17, uh, verses 2 to 7, that he's cared for uh, by God through ravens. And so God calls him away, and that's something we need to remember. God speaks to him and says, go, uh, go away from here, go to the brook Cherith. And I'm going to provide for you. He said, there's going to be a stream, uh, the brook there, that will give you water. And I'm going to send ravens to give you food. I'm going to provide for your needs. So that's what happens. He goes, the brook Cherith is known as being kind of in the boonies. And so east of the Jordan River. So it's out there. He's living by himself, watching a brook get smaller and smaller and having ravens give him foods. Uh, and we aren't specifically said how long that happens, but it happens until it dries up because of that drought. And so when it dries up, what happens next is God once again, he comes to Elijah and says, all right, Elijah, you're going somewhere, somewhere else. And he says, I'm going to care for you through a widow. And so he sent him to Zarephath, uh, where a widow is going to be prepared to provide for your needs. So Elijah goes, he travels there. Uh, and this is Zarephath is on the coast, and so he goes from east of the Jordan, travels across the Jordan River, goes all the way to the coast, up to the northern area. And so he goes and he finds out this widow has no food. And so she's getting ready to die as she prepares this last bit of food for her and her son. Uh, but she tells the widow, hey, if you make me a meal first, before you and your son, it won't run out. And so your flour won't run out and your oil won't, won't run out until it rains. So she follows, and then he does, and so he's, he's able to do that. Now, the interesting thing about Zarephath, and so it is under the rule of uh, Ahab's uncle, and so Ahab's uncle's name was El Ethbal, and so it's one of the centers of Baal worship. 
And so it was completely, I mean, he ruled that area. So God took him away from a place that was outside of where he would have been in trouble and brings him kind of right into the fight zone and says, I'm going to hide you right here. And so it brings him right in there. So, uh, so he's right under Ahab's uncle's nose. And so right in that area, right in the middle of the Baal worshiping, one of the sinners, and that's where he is, uh, that's where he's living for about three years. And so it comes, the next step in this, in this part of his history is that the widow that he's living with, her son dies, gets ill and dies. And then she comes to him, Elijah, and says, Elijah, why have you reminded God about my sin and therefore he took my son away? And so she comes to him with accusations and saying, why have you done this to me? You're remembering my sin. You're telling it to God. He took my son away. Uh, Elijah was confused. He came before God with some of the same concerns, and, uh, and he didn't get any response from God. We don't see any recorded there, but he is able to raise the widow's son, and then they continue living uh, for the rest of those three years. So that's what's going on uh, for the first part. The, the story kind of takes a twist when we get to chapter 18. Uh, this is where we see Elijah meet Obadiah first and then Ahab, where he's, he's setting off. He's done in hiding. It's been three years of hiding away. So three years of drought, three years of Ahab looking for him, and he's coming out of hiding. So he, he comes and he meets uh, Obadiah. Obadiah is someone that follows the Lord, and so he's, uh, he believes in the Lord. He's a follower, and he's gone to the point of Queen Jezebel, Ahab's wife, is killing off all the prophets that follow Yahweh, that follow God, uh, and has, she has her other false prophets come in of false gods, so she's getting rid of everything Israel has known. Uh, and Obadiah has gone through, and he has saved a hundred. And he's like, I'm hiding them from her. Now, Obadiah is very high up in Ahab's court. So he's, he's up there. He's one of his trusted people. Actually, at this point, Ahab and Obadiah, Ahab says, hey, Obadiah, come with me. Let's go find grass because we need to feed our animals. So he's a trusted man by Ahab. So Ob Obadiah first comes across Elijah, and Obadiah knows exactly who he is. And it's kind of like, oh no, and so th this is who I found. And Elijah says, go tell Ahab that I want to see him. And Obadiah is, oh my goodness, this is not good news. And he's, he's scared, and he's talking to Elijah, and he's saying, Elijah, you've been gone for three years. You disappeared three years ago. No one's been able to find you. They've been searching for you. And he says, what if that happens again? What if God sweeps you away? I go tell Ahab, and he's like, my life's on the line. I'm going to die. Well, Ahab comforts him and says, I will see Ahab today. Uh, and so Obadiah goes and gets Ahab, and then they go uh, meet. And then the famous words that Ahab says to, to Elijah when he comes, and he calls him, you troubler of Israel. And so he comes and says, you're the troubler of Israel. So that's the first meeting in three years that these two have had. He says, you're the troubler of Israel because there's been no rain. And so you're destroying the nation. Uh, and so then we see Elijah. He comes and he says, I'm not the troubler of Israel. You're the troubler of Israel because you have left the commands of God and have followed your own ways. Uh, so we have these two statements set up, one by King Ahab, one by Elijah. And there's who's really right? So really, when we get to the point of having this showdown that Elijah sets up. The whole point of it is to establish who is the troubler of Israel. That's why we have this fire from heaven. That's why we have the two sides against each other. Who is the true troubler of Israel? If we look, Elijah, he doesn't just go with Ahab to do this. He says, I want all the people there. I want the nation there. I want them to see who the true God is, and who the true troubler of Israel is. So they go call the people. Then they go and call 850 prophets of Asherah and Baal, two false gods. Baal's been around for a while. Asherah is kind of Jezebel's religion that she has brought in to this nation and to the relationship with Ahab. 
So they have these two sides that are setting up, and they want it to be a very public thing in front of the nation. It's not just an event that happens. It's kind of a big turning point in the nation where Elijah says, okay, this is it. It's all going on the line. Your gods versus my God. Who's going to win? Who's going to be the one that comes up and wins? And as we see pagan worship has been coming up on the rise, and we see these 850 prophets against one, the odds seem to be weighted in Ahab's favor. They seem to be something Elijah seems to be stacking the deck against himself. An outsider would think that Elijah doesn't really have a chance to win. 850 to 1, something that's been on the rise. Jezebel has been slaughtering all of the prophets of Yahweh, of the God that, that Elijah represented. So this show pl- showdown takes place on Mount Carmel, and it's going to show the people who the true troubler is. Uh, what we see is <clears throat> Elijah and the crowd that's there, they're thinking you're setting yourself up for, fav- for failure. You're outnumbered. He allows the false prophets to have first choice of the materials that are there. He allows the false prophets to go have first turn, and and they're thinking, man, what if their God's true? He sends down fire. It's done before Yahweh, the God of Israel, has a chance to do anything. Because they'll see that's that's what's going to happen. They do it first. That's who we're going to follow. Then we have, this is the Baal. Baal is known as being the god of lightning, of thunder, of storms, of fire. I mean, this is set up for Baal to win if he were a true god. This was his wheelhouse. Now, the god, true god of Elijah also has control and has known control over fire, thunders, uh, and storms. History has proven through either the burning bush, a hailstorm plague, the pillar of fire, that, that Elijah's God, this is his power also. So you're pitting two gods essentially up against each other that have some similar credentials, but we have a whole lot of followers on one side, and Elijah's by himself. This will be a test of which God is true, and who should the people follow. Elijah addresses the people and says, what, what are you doing? Who are you following? And they have no response. So we see that Baal's prophets go through their rituals, and no fire comes, even through the taunting and the comments that Elijah makes. Elijah then proceeds with his turn. He repairs a broken altar. He takes 12 stones to illustrate the 12 tribes, even though there's a split kingdom now. He douses his offering with water multiple times, and then he prays with confidence that the people will know who the true God is through this act. When the fire of the Lord comes down, everybody sees that it consumes the sacrifice, it consumes the wood that was on the sacrifice, it consumes the dust that is around the sacrifice, and it even consumes the stones that the altar was placed upon. The immediate response of the people was to fall on their faces and declare Yahweh to be the one true God. Elijah was victorious. He had swayed opinion. They had looked. They saw. I mean, he's thinking, this is done. This is wonderful. This is great. He couldn't have asked for anything better. And imagine the people, they're thinking, we put the two gods against each other. That one spent almost all day. Nothing happens. After one prayer, fire comes and consumes more then the sacrifice consumes everything. So they're thinking this is a no-brainer in their minds. Well, what happens next is Elijah, he turns and says, gather up all those false prophets, and then he's going to follow Deuteronomy 13, which says if a false prophet comes, and he, what he predicts and what he says doesn't happen, then he should be killed. So they, they round them all up, and, and they kill all these false prophets. So all of a sudden we have this God that everyone is following, that the king is following, that Jezebel, his wife, has, been, uh, has brought in here, and then we have Yahweh. The people have been leaning towards this because paganism has been on the rise, and all of a sudden this showdown takes place. 
and Yahweh is victorious. Yahweh comes up as the one who is true. So we have the drought ending. Elijah goes, and, and God sends a cloud. He comes to Ahab, and he says, you better go. You better go quickly, because it's going to rain fast. So <clears throat> Ahab races in his chariot towards Jezreel. Jezreel is a place that's about 20 miles from where uh, Mount Carmel, where they had this. So he's taken off on his chariot for 20 miles, and Elijah, no longer feeling... <clears throat> no longer feeling like he has to be in hiding, he's running. He's running towards Jezreel, and he beats, he beats the chariot there. And so he would have been a great one to have on the track team. <clears throat> and so because he, he's going, and God gives him this strength. So he heads there. He has this sense of confidence about him that he's going to a place where Ahab, Jezreel, where Ahab has a palace. And that's where Jezebel is currently residing. That's where she's at. And so... Ahab's going back there. Elijah's going there. He's not feeling like he has to be hidden to the people because all the people have seen that Yahweh is the one true God. Uh, the people have seen, and, and he doesn't feel this shame. He knows that the people aren't thinking, you are the one that's troubling Israel anymore because that probably was what the common thing was being said at the time. So for the past three years, he's been in hiding. And now he's making himself known to a wider group of people. Victory's been achieved. He now has confidence to be in public, no longer seen as the troubler of Israel. So then we have Ahab returning. He goes to Jezebel. He tells her everything that's happened. And so and he especially doesn't leave out the part. He says, Elijah killed all those prophets. All those prophets that ate at your table that you really loved, that you cared for, they're all gone. Jezebel was furious. Jezebel came out with a response, and she was extremely angry. She sent a messenger to Elijah that said, Today, I'm going to kill you. I will seek you out, and nothing is going to stop me. All of a sudden, Elijah's demeanor changes. No longer does he have this confidence. No longer, I mean, he just saw this happen with God. No longer is he feeling really good about the situation. He runs. He runs away. Not at God's calling. Every time before, God says, go here, go here, go here, go here. But he runs. He runs not to the north where he was uh, with the widow, not to the east where he was uh, out at the brook Cherith, not to Mount Horeb, or, uh, yeah, what, Mount Horeb, where, where it was, but he goes south. He goes south as far as he can go to Beersheba. And so because he's afraid, he knows this lady has killed so many prophets, and now she's after me. His conflict still remains. He still has an adversary after he felt it was all done. After such a high mountaintop experience, he once again goes into hiding. This is the point where he makes a quote, and I'm going to read it again. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. What I want to focus on now and for the rest of our time is how God responds to those comments made by Elijah. We're going to focus on three things right now. God provides for our needs. God makes himself known. And God orders the future. The first thing we see is God provides for our needs. Now we're in chapter 19 of 1 Kings, and we're in verses 5 to 7 right now. I'm going to read these for us. This is God talking to Elijah right after that quote that I just read in verse 4. Verse 5 says, And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake, baked on the hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. 
These verses we see once again God has faithfully provided for Elijah's needs. Just as he did with the crows, just as he did with the widow at Zarephath, God made sure that Elijah's needs were cared for. This time it was even super, uh, supernatural provision as the food he ate sustained him for 40 days in the wilderness. Now if we look and realize, Elijah never made a request to God in any one of these situations. We see the first time he says, go to the brook Cherith, I'm going to do this for you. Then he says, go to the widow at Zarephath, I'm going to do this for you. Then we see Elijah even goes off on his own all the way down to Beersheba, and God comes to him and says, all right, I'm going to provide this for you. God always knew what Elijah needed, and Elijah didn't even have to ask for it. He knew what the needs were. The angel this last time tells him that without this food, this journey is going to be too great. He knew what Elijah's limits were. He knew how far he could handle things, and he says, Elijah, without this, you can't go on. You can't go on to your next step. Elijah thought his journey was over, but God is providing for the next leg of a journey that he didn't know was happening at the time. In times that we feel alone, when we're exhausted, when we're ready to give up, we can have a confidence also that God will provide for our needs. Philippians 4.19 is a very common passage that tells us that God will supply for all of our needs. In this passage, Paul is telling of times that he was in need, of times that he was in hunger, but he said God always came through and promises to do so also for the church that was in Philippi at that time. So we can have a confidence in knowing that, that God knows our needs. God knows our limits. God provides for our needs. The second response that I want to take a look at that God makes is that God makes himself known. God doesn't only provide for our needs, but he also makes himself known. God makes himself known to Elijah in verses 9 through 12, and I'd love to read those for you right now. <coughs> There he came to a cave, that's Elijah, and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. And I, only I, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind tore the mountains and broke into pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a low whisper. God makes himself known when Elijah needs it. He approaches Elijah and says, what are you doing here? He's like, I've told you to go to all those other places. I know you were following me, but what are you doing here? And he's getting at Elijah, what, what are you thinking? What are you feeling? What's going on? And Elijah responds saying, I've earnestly been following you, and I feel like I'm the only one left. Everyone else has forsaken you, God, and they want to kill me. I've gone through all this. We had victory, and Jezebel won't stop. Then God comes before him and uses the picture of the wind, the earthquake, the fire. He says, I'm not in those. Instead, he's in the still, small whisper. That's where he shows his presence on the mountain. He shows that at times he is present quietly and in the small things. Now, Elijah, up to this point, he has seen God work. In the big things, he just saw God throw down fire from heaven to consume everything around a sacrifice, and then everyone is in awe. He has seen God provide with birds that are bringing him food. He has seen God provide through a widow who had flour and oil that did not run out. They just kept pouring it, and it just kept coming. So we saw the big miracles happen. And God made him think, I will speak 
even in the small whispers. Not only is it in the big things. We need to be thinking even when it appears that God's not working, there are times that we are drowning out that small whisper. We are looking many times for the big signs in direction in life and responses that we should have when really we should be quiet before the Lord, listening to Him, listening for that small voice. We see also that God not only provides for our needs, doesn't only make himself known, but God orders the future. And we see this in, in verses 15 to 16 of 1 Kings chapter 19, which says, And the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mehalah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. That still small voice illustration that we just saw is exactly what we see here in this passage. That's what we see in these few verses when we see why would he talk about a king of Syria? Why would he talk about a future king of Israel? How is that dealing with anything now? This is a passage where it's easy just to read through and say, okay, he's anointing people. God didn't forget him when he kind of got despairing and, so, and, and, and was ready to give up. God didn't forget him but said, hey, you still have these jobs. I'm still going to use you. But that's not only what happened. These individuals are very important. And so they, they show a lot of what's going to happen because we saw in verse 17 right there that there's going to be a whole lot of people die because of these three individuals. So there's something significant going on right here. What we see first with Hazael, who is mentioned, that God's going to anoint him through Elijah or tells Elijah to anoint him, In verse 15, it's interesting that God would have a foreign king anointed. We don't see that very often, but we see uh, Hazael plays a role of punishing an unjust Israel. Elijah has mentioned multiple times how the nation has abandoned God. He says, forsaken you, they've given up on you. God knows that. God knows when injustice happens. God knows when people have stopped following him, and God will do what he needs to do in his timing. So we see that the nation has abandoned God, and God says, this is, this is how I'm going to deal with it. This is how it's going to happen. We see Elisha, who we're going to talk about in a little bit. In 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 12, he talks about Hazael. And he says he's going to be a severely brutal leader that's going to dominate Israel. He was used as a tool to punish an unjust nation. So God says, Elijah, I want Hazael, I want you to anoint him because he is going to be my instrument of punishment for the Israelite nation. And he rules and dominates, and he is is brutal. And so he does not spare anything, and that's how God says, I am going to punish. Now, Elijah's not going to see this right away. Elijah actually is not going to personally anoint Hazael. That's going to happen with Elisha. But that's that small voice where he says, I'm not going to bring down fire and create an immediate change. Rather, instead, this is going to be political. I'm going to go about it a different way than you've seen before. So God punishes an unjust Israel through Hazael. Next, we see the second individual Where God says, Elijah, I want you to anoint Jehu to be king of Israel. Jehu does not have the role of uh, punishing Israel like Hazael does. Instead, he has a very specific role to blot out the family of Ahab. Specifically, we see that Jehu kills Ahab's son, King Jehoram. 
person that follows him. He is the one who orders Jezebel to be thrown down from an upper palace window and that comes to her death. He is the one that orders Sumerian leaders to kill Ahab's 70 sons. And 2 Kings 10 verse 11 tells us that Jehu killed the rest of Ahab's family, his great men, which would have been the warriors that surrounded him, his friends, and the priests, the false priests that he surrounded himself with, until nobody was left that was connected to the family of Ahab. God uses Hazael to punish the nation of Israel. God uses Jehu and says, I know that Ahab does wrong. He's telling Elijah, he says, Jehu is going to be the one that corrects this. Jehu is going to be my instrument that does this. Again, it's not going to happen in his lifetime. And in this same case, Elijah does not anoint him. But that happens later through Elisha. So we have the nation of Israel punished through Hazael. We have Ahab and his family being blotted out because that was God's promise earlier through Jehu, the king of Israel. Next we see Elisha. Elisha is the third individual that uh, God tells Elijah to anoint. And this is the one that he does first. Uh, he immediately, we see right after this uh, in verse 16, and so right after that, in, in this next passage, he goes immediately to an Elisha and anoints him. Now, Elisha is not the military leader. He's not the ruler. Instead, he was Elijah's successor as a prophet of God. This was God coming to him and, and giving him that confidence that I'm not done with the nation. I'm not done leading. I'm not done making my presence known. I am going to follow through through Elisha. So Elisha, Elisha comes and he trains him. Elisha is the one who, uh, through, uh, through the, the religious field, is kind of the one that finishes up. And through these three individuals, God, gets rid God puts his final punishment on the Baal worship. All these people that have been involved with it, all the, the whole nation, it's kind of purged. And they still, at times, are going to have false idol worship. But the people that were present here, where God says, or Elijah says, the nation has left you, God. Through these three individuals, God makes sure that they are gone. Punishment has taken place. We see a fourth prediction or a fourth encouragement given. The first three were through uh, anointings. In this fourth one, we see in verse 18, when God says, Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all of the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. These four things are what Elijah's been looking for. It's what Elijah's been really wanting and yearning for. This last one, he says, Elijah, you are not the only one left. You're not all by yourself. There are other people that have stayed true, that, have, that I have saved and protected from Jezebel, maybe using Obadiah for a hundred of them. We don't know how in other situations, but he says, I want to give you encouragement. You're not the only one that's going through this. You're not the only one that's going through a hard time. There are 7,000 others in Israel that have not bowed to Baal. While there are many who are being taken away and punished due to their false worship, God kept some so Elijah would, Elijah would know that he is not alone. As we think of the life of Elijah, there are a few things that I want to leave you with to serve as a challenge especially when we're feeling alone, when we're feeling when we're the only ones, when we're going through hard times. The first thing is, no God provides. We see God providing for Elijah's physical needs. He also provided much-needed encouragement when Elijah was depressed. He lets Elijah know that he is not alone. He provided someone close to serve as his helper and his successor. God knows our needs. We see so many times that God is the one that initiated the help for what Elijah's needs were. 
whether it were physical, whether it were certain types of encouragement, whether it says, you're not the only one. There are others that are staying true to me. God provided for Elijah's needs. Second thing is, seek out God in the whispers. Many times we're looking for those big signs to give us direction in life. Many times we miss him speaking in the quiet whispers. Seek God through reading his word, times of prayer, and times of quiet reflection on what God is doing in life. Sometimes we need to slow down and get out of our own way in order to hear God speaking to us. I know many times when we go through hard times, when we go through troubles, we're constantly saying, God, get me out of this. Rather than saying, God, help me learn from this. I know personally myself, and I believe it was at the past uh, pastor's meeting last week that we had. Uh, talking through the pastors, we were talking through some things, and, and I just thought, man, sometimes we get so caught up in wanting things to be easy that we, that we miss and we gloss over what God's trying to teach us in the hard times, whether that be physical hardship, whether that be emotional things that are going on, whether that be life situations that are going on, whether that be extreme sickness, we need to be looking and saying, is God trying to teach us something through this? The third thing is, trust that God has ordered your future. Trust that God has ordered your future. God will take care of injustices that happen. Things that are unjust, he sees. He does not forget. We see here with Elijah, it takes time, but God does it in his way. God has your future ordered. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what happens when you're in times of trouble or despair or hardship. He has ordered your steps. He has ordered your future. That's why we need to be looking for that small whisper to say, what are you teaching me? Because nothing comes as a surprise to God. Also want us to remember that just in times of the life of uh, Elijah, know that opposition after times of spiritual richness do not negate what God is trying to do. That came out very clear with Elijah when he had this great victory in front of the people and the people saw God work and he comes and has this stiff opposition with Jezebel and it makes him crumble. It doesn't negate what God's trying to do. Trust that he will give you the strength to follow him day by day. I'm going to pray, uh, and I want to let you know that right after we pray, uh, we are going to have uh, we're going to have a right hand of fellowship for some new members. So I'm going to call them up, and how this is going to work. Uh, there's a few things going on tonight. Uh, I'm going to pray. I'm going to call these individuals up. And then we're going to read through our covenant. Uh, and after we do that, I would encourage those of you that have children in the programs, go grab your children then. If you do not, I would encourage you to meet uh, the individuals that are, that are new members. Uh, welcome them into this local body. Uh, and then in about five minutes, so we got about a five-minute gap, Tony Gavon's going to come up here, and we have uh, in, uh, an item that we're going to be voting on uh, as a body. So we, we're going to do the right hand of fellowship, go grab your kids, and be back in here in five minutes, uh, and then we'll be able to vote, okay? I know they throw all these things at me at the end of a service. I'm like, okay, I, I got this. Uh, but let's go ahead and pray and thank the Lord for teaching us through First Kings. Dear God, you are powerful. You are strong, and you love us. Thank you for that. Dear God, I thank you for knowing all that goes on. There is nothing that catches you by surprise, and for that, it's a calming effect on me. Because I know I don't have to be worried. Because you're in control. All I have to do is trust and follow you step by step, even when it's hard. Dear God, thank you for ordering our futures. Thank you for speaking to us in any way you chose to speak to us the creator speaking to the creation help us to have a focus on listening to you in the small whispers thank you for proving yourself to be 
true over and over again. We love you very much and pray that we would have a greater confidence in you after today. We pray these things in your name. Amen.